And now I'd like to introduce you to our featured presenter today, uh, Professor Ju Julia Navi Hildesley. So Julia is a professor of the practice and the executive director of Stanford's Change Leadership for Sustainability program. Her research and teaching focuses on business strategies, leadership approaches, and cross-sector partnerships that spur global development and align systems with the goal of intergenerational well-being. Prior to Stanford, Julia served as the executive director of the Lummelson Foundation, the director of World Wildlife Fund's Pacific Marine Office, and the CEO of Washington STEM. Julia holds a BA from Stanford University and a master's in philosophy from the University of Sussex, where she was recognized as a distinguished young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2010. And with that, let us turn it over to Julia. Hello, and thank you for joining us. I'm really thrilled to have all of you here today and to talk about such an important topic, um, so important in our time and really looking forward to the Q&A at the end as well to hear some of the perspectives all of you have regarding this shift we're starting to see in business as it becomes more and more the norm to embrace sustainability. So today we're going to organize our conversation um, around three core themes. There we go. Okay, so first, why have, are we seeing the shift in approach? Why are we seeing more and more businesses and organizations in general embracing sustainability? Second, um, what strategic changes are organizations making as they embrace this change? And finally, how are they actually implementing these changes? So we're gonna look a little bit at the why and the what and the how um, throughout the hour. Um, first, let me share a perspective um, as we <laughs> got, get into the why here. You know, what is causing organizations to increasingly embrace sustainability? And Paul Pullman, former CEO of Unilever, uh, where he was for a decade, summarizes an insight that is driving the shift. And fundamentally, he says, we must develop a business model aimed at contributing to society and the environment instead of taking from them. Um, and it's not just Unilever that has this insight, of course. We're seeing organizations and businesses of all varieties, uh, from small companies to transnationals like Unilever, embracing sustainability. And not simply as we've seen in the past as an effort to comply with regulations, or to be charitable through uh, corporate social responsibility initiatives, but really um, embracing sustainability as core strategy, putting sustainability at the heart of a company's business model. So let's step back a little bit and, and ask ourselves, why are our businesses doing this? Why is this happening and why is it happening now? Um, as we've all experienced firsthand in our personal lives and in our work, um, we are increasingly operating in an environment characterized by volatility, uncertainty, complexity and ambiguity. And VUCA is, is actually a term that was coined by the US Army War College to describe the geopolitical context resulting from the end of the Cold War. But more recently, it is now used widely in business to describe the complexity of the operating environment um, that we're in. So we could of course devote an entire course to the causes of VUCA world, uh, but in a nutshell, VUCA world results from the fundamentally dynamic and non-linear interactions between human beings and the natural environment. So as we're going about our business, we are working and living in a, vol as a natural environment and there are all sorts of feedbacks and interactions um, that are so complex and non-linear that it leads to a lot of this volatility and, and complexity that we're seeing. And from the human side, we're looking at, you know, the combination of technology breakthroughs across a wide variety of fields that have, have impact, population growth, of course, depletion of natural resources and climate change, and also an increasing demand um, by the public for transparency and accountability in business. So all of this is feeding into uh, businesses shifting their approach um, to one where sustainability is more embraced. And, um, what we're starting to see is that because of the volatility companies are experiencing, they've begun to look outward in an effort to understand the sources of disruption they face and to determine how best to navigate them. So this has led many institutions to take more of a systems approach, recognizing their fundamental interconnectedness to the world around them and seeing not only the extent to which they are impacted by outside forces, but becoming more and more aware of the breadth and depth of their own impact on society and the natural environment. Back to Paul Pullman at Unilever, um, he talks about the need for companies to see themselves as part of an interconnected web linking multiple players. And taking a systems perspective 
as companies do this, it naturally deepens the responsibility companies feel and organizations feel towards diverse stakeholders as they become more aware. Um, and also, um, it becomes clear that without engagement and collaboration with stakeholders, a lot of these challenges cannot be addressed. These things are fueling a second uh, shift, which is the integration of sustainability into core strategy as a means to mitigate risk that they're facing, um, but also to strengthen their resilience in the face of VUCA world. And finally, to also capture value and, and see the opportunities for creating new value by focusing on sustainability. So before we go um, into more detail, I want to step back and just say a few words about sustainability because it is a term that is often understood differently by different people. Um, it seems to invoke disparate reactions from different communities. Um, and I think a starting place for thinking about sustainability is the framing Jane Jacobs offers when she reminds us that the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment and not the other way around. We really can't have an economy without an environment. All of the inputs come from our environment. Um, yet sustainability is really not an environmental term or a green concept as, as we've tended to think of it in the past. Um, in fact, it's a very human concept. Uh, sustainability is about building a society that provides for the long-term well-being of its people. And this requires us to recognize our fundamental dependence on the natural world and to know that we must generate social, economic, and environmental value in order to thrive. So we like to use the term intergenerational well-being to describe sustainability because we're talking about the well-being of all people, not just a privileged few. And we're talking about building a society where we can provide for that well-being, not just today, but across generations. Um, the online course in our Strategies for Sustainability program includes extensive interviews with Kate Brandt, uh, Google Sustainability Officer, and Adam Lowry, co-founder of Method Cleaning Products and Ripple Foods. And what I wanted to do is just incorporate throughout this webinar three brief clips um, from those interviews that you'll see in more um, completion on the online course to give you a few industry perspectives, people who are grappling with this in their own companies, because so many of you are doing the same. So let's turn to a, a brief clip and hear um, their perspective on um, why we're seeing the shift in business approach. Business needs to have a broader perspective around the innovation that it's providing. And at, at a very basic level, we're living in a time where a lot of the social contract between business and societies has broken down. And a lot of that, I would argue, is because of a hyper focus on shareholder primacy, right? When you put shareholders in front of anyone else, and then you know, you've got some policymakers in your back pocket, then the outcomes sometimes are things that aren't good for the population as a whole. And rightfully so, people get angry about that, right? What I'm trying to do with my business, this is what many other people are trying to do, is try to build in enlightened corporate governance into that model of innovation so that what gets innovated is inherently better for society and the environment as well. And if, if that's a design exercise, and if you can do that well, and then you can grow a business focusing not just on one thing, which is shareholder return, but a broader set of things, which makes managing and leading a business more complex and a little harder, but if you can do that and do that well, then you're achieving the goal. There is increased motivation for companies to shift towards sustainability for a few reasons. I think generally there is now an expectation that businesses will serve a social purpose. You know, we heard that from Larry Fink in his shareholder letter. Uh, that is a tremendous shift. And I think that's led to, you know, much more executive engagement from corporate leaders and philanthropy and advocating for social and environmental causes. And I think it's led to a lot more activity within companies of really having very robust sustainability programs that I think are really geared towards, you know, expectations from customers, from employees and from investors that, that we're seeing increasingly that you know, you need to have time bound goals, you need to be incorporating this into your operations and increasingly incorporating it into your business strategy and making it part of how you think about generating value. 
I think that today's operating environment is really requiring businesses to take more of a systems approach. And I think that's both because we're increasingly facing greater risks. So looking at changing climate constraints on water, constraints on other natural resources, and that sustainability is a really critical way to assess those risks, to do scenario planning, uh, and to develop new strategies in the face of a world that's changing before our eyes. Equally, I think there's a lot of opportunity. You know, when we think about developing more circular business models uh, where we're designing waste out of systems, that creates tremendous new opportunities, new opportunities for value. Thanks. So to complement their perspectives, I want to just delve in briefly to looking at the perspective of various stakeholder groups, investors, customers, and employees, and say, you know, how are they perceiving the role of business now? Are there are we starting to see shifts in that way that might also be contributing to um, the reason that business is becoming to embrace sustainability? Um, so let, let's turn first to investors. You heard Kate Brandt mention Larry Fink um, in 2018. Larry Fink, the CEO of BlackRock, the world's largest investment manager, gave a wake up call to corporate CEOs when he wrote in his annual letter to BlackRock's investees announcing that a company's ability to manage environmental, social, and governance matters demonstrates the leadership and good governance that is so essential to sustainable growth, which is why we are increasingly integrating these issues into our investment process. Um, that, was, that was a big wake up call uh, for companies. And, and of course, a lot of companies had already perceived that um, shift in, in requirement and recognized the benefits of um, reporting on environmental, social, and governance issues. Um, if we look at, um, the data, 85% of companies now produce and share ESG reports with investors, which is up from only 20% in 2011. That's a, a pretty big change in a few years. Um, and now we've got more data that demonstrates that positive ESG performance is correlated uh, with a lower cost of capital, better operational performance, and higher stock price. Let's turn to employees and look at what they're saying. So um, they're putting similar pressure on companies, younger generations in particular, who make up the largest population in the workforce, expect businesses to do much more than turn a profit. 83% of millennials and 80% of Generation Z employees believe that business success should be measured in terms of more than financial performance. Millennials also believe that employers are generally out of sync with them. When they were asked to identify, the millennials were asked to identify three priorities for business, job creation, improving society, and enhancing livelihoods, and improving the environment rose to the top. Um, while millennials say their company's top three priorities are profit generation, driving efficiency, and producing goods. These happen to be the three lowest priorities on the millennials list. Customers, too, uh, see business as responsible for improving society. 85% of people surveyed across 20 countries hold companies they buy from accountable for improving their lives. The same level of expectation they have of government, where we traditionally thought um, the institutions we traditionally thought were responsible for improving our lives. So what we're seeing is as companies start experiencing <laughs> more and more of the realities of VUCA world, as well as these heightened expectations of diverse stakeholders, they're increasingly integrating new perspectives as they take the systems approach and look beyond themselves. Um, they're engaging with more diverse stakeholders um, that they now see the deep connection they have with and ultimately recognizing that pursuing sustainability can drive innovation and long-term value creation. So here's what um, we can hear from an industry perspective. Method was a business that I started in 2000. We raised $25 million in capital. Um, when that business got sold, it achieved multiples in that sale that were far beyond businesses that had not built sustainability into their business models. The shareholders, the employees, they all made more money financially because the business, explicitly because the business was sustainable, not in spite of it. The business has since grown, the business has since sold again, and those shareholders have made more money because of the type of business that Method is, not in spite of it. So it's a very real example of shareholder value. I mean, we could just measure it on shareholder primacy alone, has been higher because the business focuses on social outcomes and the environment 
not inspired. Thank you so much. So um, I just want to shift now back to Unilever and, and mention that Paul Pullman took quite a similar tack to the one Adam Lowry is describing um, when he questioned the traditional notion that generating profits must be the primary purpose of business, ultimately the end leading to societal benefit. Rather, he argued that it was the other way around by focusing first on improving lives and generating genuinely sustainable solutions, companies would be profitable over the long term. The new operating system for business, he argued, would drive growth through innovations that bring new sustainability benefits to consumers and retailers, lower cost by reducing waste and energy use, and help manage supply chain risk by securing long-term sustainable sourcing of materials. And he called for a shift in focus from shareholders, just like the shareholder primacy Adam Lowry talks about, to all stakeholders. He says, I don't think our fiduciary duty is to put shareholders first. I say the opposite. What we firmly believe is that if we focus our company on improving the lives of the world's citizens and come up with genuine sustainable solutions, we are more in sync with consumers and society and ultimately, this will result in good shareholder returns. So he's really flipping our, our traditional understanding and, and mirroring what we heard from the millennials, which is a lot of companies just seem to be out of sync with their priorities. Paul Pullman is, is focusing on getting in sync. So let's turn from the why, our first question um, in this webinar, to the what. Um, what are some of the concrete changes that organizations are making um, as they embrace sustainability? Um, organizations are changing the way they do business across many areas, but I'd like to highlight three primary ones here and then provide some examples of each. They're adapting business models and practices to focus on sustainability. They're innovating to create sustainable products and brands. And they're also partnering, often with competitors, um, to drive scaled impact. Alongside uh, Method and Google, there are a few, but certainly growing number of companies experimenting with and adopting circular economy approaches. Uh, let's take a brief look at a couple of examples to illustrate the potential of circular models. These are just two of, of many, um, but let's, let's start with Michelin. Uh, Michelin has transitioned from a product to a service-oriented business model. By leasing rather than selling tires, the company stays engaged with customers because it has that continuous engagement with them rather than just selling a product and saying goodbye, and then can gather customer feedback and inform product innovation more efficiently. By controlling its product through leasing rather than selling, um, good tires can be recovered and released. And end of life cycle tires can be recycled into playground surfaces or converted into fuel. The company has 97% recycling rates in the EU and Brazil. And this is something that's much more possible because it is controlling the supply by leasing rather than selling. Caterpillar um, has a global network of remanufacturing facilities and takes back millions of end of life units. That's each year, um, which requires 85 to 95% less energy than new production and which reduces, of course, waste and the need for virgin resources. A growing number of companies, such as Eileen Fisher, a lot of companies you know, Warby Parker, Ben & Jerry's, Etsy, Seventh Generation, Method, which you heard about, have become certified benefit corporations, or B corporations, as a way to operate under a legal requirement to integrate social, economic, and environmental values and goals. B Corporations are for-profit entities, just like C corporations, but they uh, are required legally um, to meet the highest standards of verified social and environmental performance and to consider the impact of their decisions on all stakeholder groups, not just shareholders, um, including their workers, customers, suppliers, community, and the environment. There are now 3,000 B corporations across about 150 industries and 60 corporations. Several multinationals, um, it's quite interesting to see, including Procter & Gamble, Unilever, Danone, General Mills, and others have recently accelerated their acquisition of B corporations. Um, 
And they say they're, they're using these sustainability innovators, these big corporations, in integrating them within their own companies to help accelerate their own learning on environmental, social, and governance issues to figure out how to drive sustainable product and brand creation. Um, and data illustrates the financial benefits of the B Corporation approach. Um, B Corporations averaged a 50% revenue growth rate during the 2008 financial crisis and a, had a higher revenue growth rate than public firms of comparable size throughout the subsequent Great Recession, according to a 2018 study conducted at Yale University. Um, let's hear a little bit more from, from Adam and Kate. So both of the businesses that I've started, Method Products and Ripple Foods or B Corps, um, they're both certified B Corps and benefit corporations, both in Delaware. And what's been interesting is the journey. I think with Method, we, we were one of the founding B Corps back in 2007. I forget exactly where we were on the rating scale, which goes from zero to 200. I think we were right around 100 or maybe high 90s to begin with. The business is now at 142, and it's, I believe, the highest, if not, if not, it's one of the highest manufacturing businesses, um, highest rated B Corps in the world. And a lot of that is a function of some of the things that we've been able to do as we've grown. The, the most shining example of that would be building a sustainable manufacturing facility in the inner city of Chicago to make all of Methods products for North America. And this is a facility that's renewably powered with utility scale wind and solar, uh, it's water neutral, uh, it's landfill free, it's got the largest rooftop greenhouse in the world growing leafy greens on its roof, growing vegetables in a food desert. So really cool example, those are the types of things that you can do as you start to achieve some scale and you have a bigger balance sheet, you can do more and more interesting things. And importantly, those are things that are not just done so that I can sit here and talk about them. Those are things that actually lower the cost structure of the manufacturing of the business. They improve our uh, vacancy rates and truancy rates on uh, line workers at the factory. They're hard financial metrics that those sustainability investments are allowing a method to enjoy now. Um, you know, and that's reflected in a B Corp score. And that's, that's the way it should be. If you do the right things, it should accrue to all three bottom lines. It should get reflected in how you measure yourself from a social and environmental standpoint. So let's shift now to sustainable products, the third area I mentioned we'd, we'd explore. Um, companies are recognizing the growing opportunity for sustainable product innovation as consumers increasingly prefer sustainable options. And consumer demand is also moving as with population changes um, to emerging markets where needs are often related directly to sustainability, access to water, sanitation, et cetera. So what we're starting to see is, is companies really taking off in terms of capturing the value that's possible through sustainable um, product and brand innovation, but also some interesting efforts to really work collaboratively with partners on the ground to pair sustainable products and brands with campaigns that create positive social and environmental impact. So let's look at Unilever um, as an example in India. Um, you, the company recognized that cholera, typhoid, and skin and eye infections were the leading causes of child mortality. Um, so it designed, it innovated a new product, Life Buoy Soap, which is um, a water saving soap because this happens to be in a very arid region, um, but also with 10 times the protection against the specific disease causing germs that were the ones causing these, these mortal um, diseases for, for children. And then what they did is after innovating the product, they partnered with local governments, NGOs, and a network of 70,000 rural women to integrate product marketing and distribution with hand washing campaigns, um, reaching millions of households and dramatically reducing childhood disease rates. Unilever um, has developed 26 of these sustainable living brands, what they call their sustainable living brands, which grew 46% faster than the rest of the business and delivered 70% of the company's overall growth in 2017. Now, um, some challenges are um, certainly too big for one company to tackle alone, and um, even one sector of corporations to tackle alone, really, it, they require partnership across civil society, government, and the private sector. Um, and so what we're starting to see is more and more companies recognizing this and forging alliances, um, often engaging in pre-competitive problem solving um, to shift their sectors towards sustainability for collective benefit. 
Um, I'll just give a few examples, and these are certainly very complex uh, systems challenges uh, with no simple answers, but this will give you a sense of, of what some companies are doing in partnership with government and civil society. The Consumer Goods Forum, for example, is a network of 400 retailers and manufacturers across 70 countries. They represent $4 trillion in combined sales, and they're working together to reach net, uh, zero net deforestation in their supply chains. So palm oil has been a big issue that many of you have probably heard about, um, leading to a lot of deforestation of very important rainforests in Indonesia. Um, the Consumer Goods Forum and, and, and network of retailers there are, are working with Indonesian government and other international agencies, civil society, and, and a range of, of palm oil uh, plantations to try to remove uh, deforestation out of the supply chain, figure out how else to grow palm oil um, that is less, less destructive. And because they're, they're working on this together, no one company necessarily will lose competitive advantage if they step up first and say, okay, we're going to do this, but the other companies operate business as usual. Um, that, that first leader may, may lose competitive advantage while doing this together and making a shared commitment and working on the challenge. It allows for greater innovation and also um, creates more incentive for everyone to move in the right direction. The Marine Stewardship Council is another initiative. Um, I worked on the MSC very um, intensely about 20 years ago when it was being launched by Unilever and World Wildlife Fund. And, and the vision was really to create an economic incentive for sustainable fishing through certification and eco-labeling of well-managed fisheries so that products from those fisheries would have chain of custody verification, end up in our restaurants or our grocery stores and be marked with the eco-label you see there um, to indicate to all of us that they came from sustainable sources. And many of you probably know the state of our oceans um, is dire. Um, global fisheries are, have been collapsing worldwide for, for decades. And the MSC offers a similar opportunity to bring government, business, and civil society together to create um, an organization that is, is driving uh, for positive change. There are currently about 10% of fisheries worldwide certified as, as MSC um, sustainable. Finally, um, the Sustainable Apparel Coalition has created a set of standardized tools to help companies in the apparel, textile, and footwear industry measure environmental and social impacts across their supply chains, allowing them to achieve much greater transparency and address um, the unsustainable behavior collectively. As I mentioned, none of these efforts is simple, nor is any of them without unintended consequence and consequences and trade-offs. Um, companies in the Consumer Goods Forum, for example, don't have clear ways to engage the thousands of smallholder farmers who are growing oil palms. Yet without them, deforestation will continue. So it's really an effort that is, is very complex and um, certainly um, has not yet reached scale in terms of success, and none of these three, but it is an avenue through which change can happen and in which systems change can happen. Um, and we don't really think there's any other way to do it. It's just important to acknowledge how complex and challenging it is. So let's um, shift now to a bit of the how. We've talked about why businesses are shifting their approach. We're talking, we've talked a bit about some of the strategic changes organizations are making. You know, what exactly are they doing when they embrace sustainability? But also, it's really important to think about how are organizations going about this internally? How are they implementing these changes? What barriers are they coming up against as they try to make this shift? So um, let's take a look inside Unilever to explore this. Um, in 2010, Unilever launched a 10-year sustainable living plan, or SLP, covering all aspects of its business, incorporating all brands and divisions in every country where it works. Um, and SLP outlined three 10-year goals aligned with its purpose to make sustainable living commonplace. So at that time in 2010, Unilever revisited its purpose and really focused in on, you know, our purpose as an organization is to make sustainable living commonplace. And so they framed these three um, big 10-year goals as part of the sustainable living plan. They said they first want to help more than 1 billion people improve their health and well-being. We have that brief case of the life buoy soap as an example. Um, they said they want to have the environmental footprint of Unilever products. And third, they want to source 100% of their agricultural raw materials sustainably. And back to the oil palm growers I mentioned, enhance the livelihoods of millions of people across the value chain. You know, if 
how do you really take responsibility at that level for your entire value chain all the way down to the growers? So um, they also have taken this very seriously in terms of um, establishing targets and um, sub goals under each of these major goals. So for example, under health and hygiene or under um, health and well-being, they've established goals around health and hygiene and improving nutrition. Under reducing environmental impact, they've set goals and targets around greenhouse gases, water use, waste and packaging, and, uh, in, and uh, sustainable sourcing. And then finally, under enhancing livelihoods, they've set goals and targets in ter terms of fairness in the workplace, opportunities for women, and inclusive business. Progress against the targets is measured and reported in Unilever's annual report and accounts to shareholders. So they've been very transparent about both the goal setting and the metrics and targets they're using, but also on reporting on an annual basis um, in public forum, how they're doing. So um, in order to do the work, and this goes back to the internal work I, I talked about in introducing this section of the webinar, um, in order to align the company behind the sustainable living plan, Unilever needed to revisit its internal systems and processes and reorient corporate behavior, look for where things were aligned with this goal and look at where they had processes or systems that worked against um, the goals they stated and figure out what to do about it. So uh, for example, Unilever has tied, um, since it launched the SLP, tied remuneration and performance evaluations to achieving the objectives of the sustainable living plan. Um, it's removed incentives for short-term profit maximization um, by deciding not to publish quarterly reports. There are very few publicly traded companies who've made that decision. Um, but there's um, actually recent data that demonstrates that those companies that have actually have better performance because they aren't driven by decision making for short term um, short term results to report to shareholders. Um, they also established two board committees whose sole responsibility uh, is to provide top down oversight on the implementation of the sustainable living plan. And also all internal and external communications and human resources activities include the SLP making sure that across this massive corporation, all the employees are hearing about um, this priority and feeling a part of it. Perhaps most importantly, the company supports ongoing learning and adaptation by engaging employees. It's one thing to learn about it through communications, but it's another thing to be engaged as an employee, um, as a manager, as a supply chain partner, in the process of designing and implementing practices that support the SLP. So for example, uh, employees work directly on the company's global wellness efforts, such as the Dove SOAP self-esteem project um, or the Help of Child Reach 5 campaign, deepening their commitment to the sustainable living plan and deepening their understanding. Unilever managers also work across the organization and in partnership with suppliers and distributors to conduct life cycle assessments of their product lines so that they can evaluate social and environmental impacts and determine changes that need to be made. So what about progress? It's one thing to set goals and targets and um, it all looks great, but actually um, how is Unilever doing? Um, it's actually on track to meet around 80% of its sustainable living plan commitments across its three major goals by 2020. Um, by the end of 2017, Unilever had reached 601 million people through its programs on hand washing, sanitation, oral health, self-esteem and safe drinking water against the target of 1 billion. It had reduced its waste by 29% against its target of 50%, sourced 56% of its products sustainably as verified by third-party certifiers against its target of 100%. And finally, um, it had exceeded its target to engage at least 500,000 smallholder farmers in its supply network to improve their agricultural practices, reaching actually 716,000 farmers. So, Interestingly, rather than suffering um, from this new business approach, much as Adam Lowry said, Unilever has continued to, to perform well. Um, Unilever share prices outperformed the Euronext 100 and the FTSE 100 indices consistently over the past nine years. And just stepping back, Unilever offers one perspective on how to create a business model focused on sustainability by defining new goals and metrics, innovating sustainable products and brands, and aligning its internal systems and processes to support this new business model. Um, maybe your organization is quite different, um, but what would long-term business goals focused on sustainability look like for you? 
Um, what does sustainability mean in your context and, and where does sustainability offer opportunities for growth or risk mitigation, value creation? How might some of Unilever's changes in internal practices be relevant and doable in the context of your organization? So stepping back, we began with these three core questions for the webinar. You know, why are we starting to see this shift in, in approach where businesses are, are really starting to pursue and embrace sustainability? What are some of the strategic changes organizations are making? There are obviously a multitude. We looked at a few. Um, and how are they going about implementing these changes? What are, what are sort of the nuts and bolts of, of actually trying to do this in context? Um, and, and what we saw is, you know, it, for the first question, we're, we've got businesses responding to the reality of VUCA world, of changing stakeholder expectations, definitely heightened expectations of the role of business in improving lives, in solving social challenges, in tackling 21st century global, um, global challenges. Um, but also that um, sustainability has a real role to play in helping businesses mitigate risk and lower costs and drive growth. Um, under the second, we looked at some new business practices, including circular economy, um, pursuing B corporation status um, to sustainable products and sector wide partnerships. And then we looked at how Unilever in particular is aligning goals. Um, processes and incentives to really support um, support its, its objectives around sustainability to really walk the talk internally to make it possible to make progress against those goals. And so just here at the end before we move to q and I want to just step back and, and look at these broader shifts we are seeing uh, in society with respect to business. Um, what we talked about today is part of a larger evolution that's been going on for decades where we're, we're seeing companies move from this focus on compliance and corporate social responsibility um, to one where sustainability is actually a strategy. It's not just a charitable act or something we've got to do to comply with regulations. It's actually a strategy for doing well. Um, and as we heard from many, Adam Lowry and Paul Pullman and others, this shift from focusing on shareholder primacy to one of really seeing the whole network of stakeholders companies are connected to um, and impacting and being impacted by. And then also short-term profit, moving more towards long-term value creation. Um, how do we endure over the long-term, generate value, have relevance, live up to the responsibility that we have as business in this changing world that is so volatile and ambiguous and, and um, complex. And, and finally, how do we start thinking now about not just company leadership, being a great leader as a, as a company in your, in your sector, but also leading your sector through global partnerships? How do we, how do we move full sectors you know, to better practice and, and actually partner with some of our competitors to make that happen? And that leads to the final point, which is rather than competitiveness you know, being supreme, we're starting to see a, a real recognition that the collaboration is key. And just to close, I think, you know, I want to share the message that I think in order for business to really fully capitalize on the opportunities that sustainability presents and to play the leading role it must in tackling 21st century global challenges, these shifts that we described today that, that really aren't as mainstream as, as we'd like them to be really need to become universal cultural norms, simply the way things are done in the 21st century. And all of you listening today, thank you for your time. I'm really looking forward to your questions, but you have a really important role to play in this. Wherever you are in your organization, whatever position, you can start by asking curious questions. You can start by taking a systems perspective and being sure others around you are seeing the way in which your organization is so fundamentally connected to other stakeholders and the natural environment, the social and cultural and historic context. Um, and you can start demonstrating opportunity through cost saving measures that you might identify within your units or incredibly great value creation opportunities through, through new product design that's actually really meeting a social or environmental need um, that has broader value. So look forward to hearing your questions and, and thanks so much for your attention. Okay, great. So now we'll move on to answering your questions. So clearly, you know, we have an audience that is really experienced and knowledgeable at the, about the topic of what you've presented really resonated with, um, you know, their thoughts and your views on uh, sustainability and corporate strategy. Um, 
and we, we've gotten, you know, a, a few questions really around kind of the specifics of implementation, you know, the challenges, the barriers and all of that. So one of the questions that we got from participants is that, you know, this line of thinking is really great for companies engaged in manufacturing, you know, resources and traditional industries. But are there any examples and, you know, are there any ways um, as to how a company that's in a service industry can kind of engage and help out with this initiative? You know, for example, a company that's in financial services and business services, how can they contribute to this effort? Yeah, great question. And certainly I would argue that it is universally relevant, but certainly um, needs to be interpreted and manifested differently depending on what kind of company or sector or industry you're in. So absolutely great question. Um, I think Google, uh, we didn't hear as much from Kate as you will in the online course um, in, in my short clips, but she talks a lot about their emphasis and, you know, using Google Advantage where they have, you know, incredible advantage in AI and machine learning and cloud computing and pull those together to generate incredible cost savings, um, billions of dollars in uh, the heating and cooling of their, the cooling in particular of their data centers. Um, and so it really, you've got to sit where, you're, where you are. At Google also, you know, it's not just cost savings um, from a sustainability standpoint, they focus there first and, you know, focusing on using, again, having purely renewable energy sourcing their company. Um, but they also move towards societal benefit. You know, how can we actually use our tools to generate benefit for society? So they've actually innovated this interesting um, tool called Global Fishing Watch, where they've taken their GPS um, capacity, combined it with um, machine learning, with an algorithm that would help them identify um, getting data using, you know, just getting masses of data from around the world on, on boats out on the ocean and then being able to identify which boats are actually fishing boats versus cargo vessels, etc. Uh, and then being able to see where fishing boats are actually actively fishing and if in fact they're fishing illegally, helping governments, helping empower governments to really protect their fisheries more effectively. So it depends what industry you're in and how you can combine your talents and your skills and your advantages and your, your tech know-how to, to find the right solutions that work for your company. I think related to the service question, in particular, I mean, Michelin is an interesting example where it was a product driven company and Philips has shifted too from selling light lighting services um, from shifting to pro from products to selling light as a service um, and Michelin's leasing tires so that they're controlling that that um, That product. So a lot of companies are shifting to um, from product to service models. And I think there are ways in which any company can can make that shift. Great. So the second question that we have is, you know, as a lot of more companies are paying more attention to this topic, they're reporting, they're redesigning products, you know, their branding is more aligned with the sustainability message overall. There's also kind of criticism that comes up, you know, where people are, are mentioning or accusing companies of greenwashing, you know, their practices, their products, and et cetera. So, you know, how can we hold corporations accountable? And, you know, as consumers or as civil society, what are some of the metrics and things that we can look for to really identify identify whether a company is simply quote unquote greenwashing or are they actually, uh, you know, uh, dedicated to this effort? No, it's, it's a great question. And it's a huge challenge. We faced it early on with the Marine Stewardship Council. As soon as we launched the Marine Stewardship Council, which, you know, we took a lot of time to develop the global standard for sustainable fishing. It was based on the UN FAO code of conduct, which had existed for many years. It was a very high standard um, and scientifically validated in terms of, okay, this is really a good definition of a well-managed fishery. Well, as the MSC label gained traction, a number of industry labels came up where industry then created its own label for sustainable fishing and put that on, on products. And so it really took education of consumers. And I, th I think that's what it is. It's education of consumers. It's testing these different labels and, and really getting the truth about what, what is behind the label. What does it really mean? Um, and, and that is, yes, as the person who asked the question acknowledges, it's, it's very complex. I, one thing that was really important for the Marine Stewardship Council is to have the World Wildlife Fund, you know, WWF Panda logo alongside Unilever when the, when the organization first launched because it gave credibility um, and it held the standard to a very high level. And, and then once the tent widened and many, many more NGOs became involved, those NGOs made sure that that standard stayed high and appropriate and many times pushed the MSC saying the standard wasn't high enough and a fishery that got certified shouldn't have been certified and challenged them. So this is the, the complexity of the work, but it, but it needs to be done. And I think 
you know, new technology offers some benefit. I think we will be able to trace chain of custody more easily now with blockchain and with other technologies that will help us ensure that um, we know uh, about the products that we're buying and we know more about them. But yes, great, great question. So another question is that, you know, our participants come from a variety of different companies, you know, from different industries and at different scales. So a lot of times, you know, the companies that are getting the most exposure through these initiatives are the large corporations. You know, these are multinational corporations. These are very big uh, companies that have reached into many different industries and products. So how can we get smaller or medium sized businesses to be more engaged or join these initiatives led by these larger corporations and how can you know small and medium businesses contribute to this effort. So when you say join these initiatives, what are you referring to. So, for example, with you know the consumer uh, the, the, the forums that you've talked about, you know, with MSC, you know, a, a lot of times the companies that are represented in these initiatives are large multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. So how can small and medium sized businesses also participate. Well, I think it's absolutely essential that they do because the the sector is complex and it, you know, while there is a lot of consolidation and a lot of control um, and market share within the larger companies, the smaller companies are, are essential and play a vital role. And in fact, in the case of the oil palm example, it really is, you know, one of the challenges is what do you do with thousands and thousands of farmers who don't have a clear alternative. I and mean, is Unilever going to take care and make sure that their farming practices are sustainable and their livelihoods are secured? Because if not, they have only one way to support themselves, which is to continue to cut the forest and, and grow either food or, or oil palm for, for, for engaging in the cash economy. So um, it is absolutely essential that, that all scales are engaged. And I think, um, you know, some smaller companies can play a leadership role. I, I think about Sustainable Harvest Coffee Company, and they you know, they're a small operator within the huge coffee, relatively consolidated coffee industry. And they said, we're going to have a different model. We're going to have a relationship coffee model, which is basically, you know, we're going to take the linear supply chain and make it circular. And we are going to have every grower that we work with part of a team that is connected to roasters and bankers and um, retailers so that everybody in the supply chain knows what the reality of doing business is like uh, for each stakeholder group in the supply chain. And, and they have built that model. They have Let's Talk Coffee events um, that they host. Um, and they innovated every year in a coffee growing country. And now all the big players are coming. McDonald's is coming, you know, Walmart's coming. They want to understand. And, and Sustainable Harvest created that platform as a very small company that said, you know, we're a B corporation. We have a different business model. We put 50% of profit back into farmer training. Um, and we believe in transparency. They will not do business with anyone unless every transaction in the entire supply chain is transparent. So from farmer to roaster and retailer, every transaction is transparent. And, um, and that's allowed them to build these trusting relationships and, and shift the way business is done uh, for this segment of the coffee industry. So small companies can, can play a very disruptive and, and positive role. Great, so we're getting really close to the hour right now. We have time for one last question. So um, this question specifically concerns kind of your experience and your perspective. So Julia, you've worked with you know, a lot of different sectors. You've worked on partnerships between government and, and business and, and industry with companies of different size. So do you see you know, certain business sectors or certain industries being more receptive to this change than others? And conversely, you know, which industries or which sectors are you seeing the greatest resistance? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think what is interesting is to see how different issues engage different stakeholders and, and how that happens. I mean, is it because you get a Greenpeace campaign and you're forced to deal with the palm oil challenge, which was, was the case for Nestle and, and Unilever when they launched a video? Um, or is it that, you know, you have an enlightened leader who really wants to take responsibility and has, has insight into some of the impacts the company's having or a combination? Um, I think about a lot of the um, chemical companies and things who are starting to get more and more engaged because of the plastics issue. So maybe some traditional industries we thought wouldn't necessarily engage so much in this issue are really recognizing as we look at our oceans and they have become filled with, with plastic, um, including microplastics. The average seafood consumer has, consumes about 11,000 particles of microplastics per year. 
Um, so it's not just the plastic we can see in the ocean and we know that we're dumping into the ocean, but it's now all of the, the microplastics that are there. And so companies are starting to recognize responsibility. And um, I'm working right now on an ocean plastics initiative to, to really say, how do we get all of these global actors from throughout the supply chain engaged in this, from the chemical companies um, to the recycling infrastructure globally across nations. Um, so I think really it depends how you look at the, at the challenge, but, but everybody, everybody has a stake and everybody's connected to the, to the problem and the solution. So I, I think it's just a matter of, you know, what incites the initial, initial engagement. Great, so we are on top of the hour right now and we're gonna have to wrap up the Q&A session. So again, thank you very much, Julia, today for sharing your knowledge with our participants. Um, for those of you who have indicated an interest in the program, our team will definitely be reaching out with more information. If you have any pressing questions for Julia or about the program, feel free to reach out to um, our team as well. So as a final reminder, you know, the recording of this webinar will be emailed to you within a week, and you can always visit us at globalimpact.stanford.edu. So thank you all for joining us today and have a great rest of your week.